We are delighted uh, with what our ACCI and ABA colleagues have, have done on behalf of the 10th anniversary uh, conference. At this point, uh, if, uh, Colonel, are you here? If Mike, you could just come up to the uh, table here. We at AACC uh, are blessed uh, with so much in terms of personal interactions with our Afghan brothers and sisters, in terms of personal interactions with uh, Afghan government officials and U.S. government officials. And over the years, uh, we, we are exposed to a range of, of people who are dedicated uh, to the cause of rebuilding Afghanistan, uh, it's a real special benefit for, for being part of AACC. And um, in particular, for our morning keynote, I, I want to introduce someone who, who fits that description marvelously. And I'm talking about Lieutenant Colonel retired in the U.S. Special Forces Green Berets, Michael Walsh. Mike has, in his short life, he's still a very young guy, very young. <laughs> wizened by experience, I might add, uh, has some amazing experience that he can share with our group. Um, he is the president and CEO of Meta Solutions, which many of you have been exposed to. It's an up and coming, very dynamic defense contractor, uh, policy, analytical group, uh, commercial promotion in that particularly Afghanistan, uh, Middle Eastern, South Asian area. Uh, it, it's, uh, it was formed by Mike in conjunction with the great Mary Beth Long, a long time uh, uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, Assistant, Sec uh, Assistant Secretary. Um, and uh, Mike's experience is not only on special, for special operations missions in Afghanistan and elsewhere, but Mike's experience uh, extends to the Bush White House uh, when the war on terror was hot as a pistol and it was, you know, 9-11 was not that far away. And uh, Mike served uh, in the office of vice president uh, and was his advisor on uh, Afghanistan, South Asia, and uh, counterterrorism activities. So Mike has written a book about his experiences in politics in the White House, working with Congress and the press, and also in the field in special operations. And if you want to read a powerful expression of Mike's experience in the field in Afghanistan and with policy over Afghanistan, you got to get Warrior Diplomat. It is one hell of a book published by Potomac Press. And um, I'm in the course of reading it. You know, I, I got it just recently. And Mike had a book signing party, uh, one of his national book tour uh, signing parties here in Washington, D.C. And because it was so close to the conference, I haven't had time to fully, fully finish it. But I got to tell you, it is a wonderful barn burner of a read. So um, without further ado, uh, I am honored, pleased to have as a friend and colleague, uh, Mike Walsh. Mike. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you. Uh, thank you all for, for being here this morning. It's so great to see so many friends. Uh, and so many folks that, that we've worked with over in Kabul and the international community and Dubai and, uh, and, and really 
around the region to make Afghanistan a better place. So one thing on the book that I'm, that I'm very passionate about is any profits that come from its sales, and we have some in the back, are going to both veterans charities and a charity to promote women's education in, uh, in Afghanistan, which I'll talk about in a moment. So please spread the word. Again, everything is, everything is going to a, to a good cause. You know, as Son mentioned, um, I've had this fascinating and blessed back and forth over the last 13 years when it comes to the war on terror and, and the war on Afghanistan. I literally, just in one snapshot of that, walked out of the White House Situation Room in, in January of 2009 when we were dealing with, still in a, in a very real sense, we were dealing with the attacks on Mumbai, what our response was, would India and Pakistan go back to war, uh, how, how did that affect our effort in Afghanistan and found myself about 35 days later as a reserve special forces officer in full kit on the border with host in, in Pakistan and dealing with it from that perspective. So the book, you know, Don very graciously held up really looks at the war from about 2003 to the present day from all of those different perspectives. I worked for Secretary Rumsfeld, I worked for Secretary Gates who very kindly endorsed the book. Uh, as, as was mentioned for Vice President Cheney, and then several tours out on the ground from Nimruz to Helmand to Aruzgan, all the way up to Jalalabad and Nangarhar. Uh, and I think you know, what you'll see up here, and I, I've asked that pictures just kind of scroll through as I'm, as I'm talking, is that we always need to be reminded, whether in, we're in Washington or Kabul or other capitals, we need to be reminded of the effects that we're really having out on the ground and what's at stake in, in this effort. And I always think it's, you know, all of these photos that you'll see are out in the villages of Afghanistan where I think uh, whether it's in Afghanistan or now Iraq or Syria, whether this broad long war uh, that we're in will be fought uh, and won. So let me just take a moment, sure. Let me just take a moment to kind of take a step back as I, as I do in the book and let's review some history as it applies to Afghanistan. One of the reasons I wrote it was a very dear friend of mine and mentor that many of you know, uh, Marin Stramecki, uh, Dr. Marin Stramecki, one of the probably the two or three people in the world that have had their PhD in Afghan politics, told me I had to capture these experiences for future historians. Uh, that one day, 40, 50 years from now, historians will look back on first-person accounts and say, why, why are we where we are in this effort? I'm convinced that historians are going to look back on U.S. policy towards Afghanistan and look at kind of four key mistakes that we've made up to this point. The first was that we never adjusted our strategy after we defeated al-Qaeda in 2001. You know, why were we there afterwards? Um, and eventually that evolved from about 2002 to 2006 to a counterinsurgency strategy and a state building strategy. But in that meantime, the Taliban became resurgent. And where we found ourselves was always kind of what I call chasing the violence. So as the violence got worse, we put in more efforts. And the violence continued to get worse and then we put in more troops. We never got ahead of it until the situation had deteriorated so badly in 2009 that we finally had the surge announced by President Obama. Um, the other effort, frankly, I mean, I'm very candid, is that we outsourced the effort to NATO. And we outsourced the effort from a security standpoint to our European partners who signed up to do peacekeeping like they did in Bosnia. But by the time they kind of got their troops on the ground in 2006, 2007, found a very violent, very difficult situation I was on the ground in uh, Lashkargah, Garmshire, and Kajaki, and over in uh, Tarankout when the British and the Dutch and then the Canadians came to the south, and they were not prepared. Let me just be very frank. Uh, they were not ready for the level of violence that they were facing, and the problem was their people back home and their parliaments and their political situation wasn't ready either. They, were, they weren't ready for the casualties and the violence that that came from those efforts. And so you saw things like national caveats, restrictions on what they could and couldn't do, and you saw just a very, very difficult situation uh, evolve from that. The third thing, which I know is very dear to many people here, 
is that from a U.S. perspective, and I was, again, in both the Pentagon and the White House as we were trying to deal with it, we never solved our issue with, with the sanctuary in Pakistan, and we still haven't. Um, and, you know, if you look if, at the history of insurgencies and guerrilla warfare, none of them have been successful when the insurgency has a sanctuary next door, whether it's Laos and Vietnam or whether it's the Fatah in Afghanistan, we must solve that problem. We haven't, and we must continue to, to, to make progress in that regard. But I think as historians look back, that's going to be a key effort. And the fourth, what I call the most, and what I think is the most important, was president, the current president announcing our withdrawal years in advance of it happening. Uh, you know, I was on the ground and host uh, in my headquarters when President Obama made his speech in West Point announcing the surge, but in the same speech announcing its withdrawal. And one of my officers was standing next to me and said, can you imagine, uh, for you historians here, Franklin Delano Roosevelt announcing D-Day, and then in the same speech telling the Germans that it would only be there for six months or a year? I mean, what? What, what message would we have sent then and how would that have, that have worked out? And you know, we saw the effects immediately out on the ground. I had been working for over a year to build a relationship with the Mangal tribe, uh, tribal elder uh, Gaforzai, uh, up in the mountains of Host, uh, for those of you familiar with Host, up in Calendar, in Calendar District. And he had about 1,500 tribal Arvakai, you know, uh, militia, so to speak, uh, defending their interests, and he was asking for our help. The Haqqani network was building training camps, seizing his land, harassing his villages, and he was asking for his help, but it took time, as we all know, relationships matter, to build a level of trust. About two weeks after the President's West Point speech announcing the surge, but then the withdrawal in December of 2009, I had my final meeting with uh, Gafurzai. And in a country with, you know, very little television, very little kind of international media. Um, you know, I went up there, and he had already heard about the speech. Very cold reception. I mean, we had talked about our family. We hugged every time we met. We had really gotten to know each other and built a strong relationship. He didn't offer tea. Uh, it was a very cold reception. And when I finally scratched at it uh, long enough to find out what was going on, he said, you know, we always suspected, the Afghan people always suspected, the government and the army always suspected you would abandon us. Now your president has said it. He said, you're not going to stand with us anymore. And I tried to you know, explain, no, it was just the surge, and there was a nuance, and that it would just be a few troops coming. And he said, yeah, look, all he heard was we were abandoning them again. And he told me as we were leaving, and I was devastated, and that he said, I cannot work for, with you. Uh, tomorrow night, the Haqqanis will have a gun to my family's head. And he said, until America is prepared to commit its grandchildren, not its children, but its grandchildren, to stand side by side with my grandchildren, we can't work together. It won't work. And that, that's actually how I ended, ended my book. That statement, I think, really says it all. And we saw a number of other effects immediately after, after the withdrawal announcement. We saw corruption spike because there was kind of this notion of the Americans are leaving. I need to get what I can. We saw capital outflows. We saw investment withdrawal. Um, you know, there was, there was just a number of things that I think we're still dealing with uh, in terms of that question of our lack of commitment. So the bottom line is our lack of commitment over time and now has everyone in the region guessing. The Afghan government, the new government, the Afghan people, our enemies. What will America's role be? Will it be lights out, goodbye, a la what we did in Iraq? Um, you know, even though we've signed a strategic partnership agreement pledging our commitment to 2024, our current policy is to withdraw all U.S. forces by the end of 2016. I think that is... Uh, going to be looked back on, and I think I look at it right now as a massive strategic mistake. So what is our current policy going forward? I think it's one right now based on a lot of assumptions. I think we're assuming that the Afghan National Army and police can stand on its own. 
Uh, I think they're doing a fantastic job, but they need our support. And I think they're going to need our support for at least a generation. Uh, I think we're assuming this current government can transition. For my American friends you know, outside of Washington that are asking me about this, you know, in Florida, Georgia, what have you, I say, imagine if you had Obama and Romney in the same White House together. Um, they're both good men, and I, I know uh, President Ashraf Ghani, and I know Mr. Abdullah, and I've met with them a number of times, and they're fantastic men. I worry about the kind of next layer behind them and the layer uh, behind them. So I'm optimistic, but it's going to be a shaky period, and I certainly don't think we should be withdrawing all of our support at the same time the Afghan government is trying to work through this historic transition. I think we're assuming that reconciliation talks will proceed in our interests. I think we're assuming that ethnic tensions won't continue to rise, and I'm convinced that's massively underestimated here in Washington, the level of ethnic tension that has come out of these elections. But I think most importantly, we're assuming that Al-Qaeda won't reconstitute like ISIS has. Uh, I think they can and are going to try, and I think we have to stay engaged to make sure that doesn't happen. So where are we now? Right now, frankly, I think security is pretty good. In Kabul, in mazar sharif in Herat, in a lot of the places that I've been. Uh, my company, Meta Solutions, still has an office there. We're still very much engaged in the private sector and are now uh, just began working with our partner, uh, Assad Mateen and the Oxus Group in some advisory role with the Ministry of Defense. Security is fine. Are there problems? Yes. Are there neighborhoods all over the United States that I wouldn't go right now and walk around at at night? Yes, of course. A good friend of mine, a former soldier of mine, is the captain of the Newark, New Jersey SWAT team. And if you know Newark, New Jersey, you know that he is in gunfights every single day. There are unstable portions all over the world. But what is our policy going forward to maintain that level of security to make sh and to increase it out in the rural areas and so that our assumptions that our current policy is based on, the army, the transition of the government, Al-Qaeda can't reconstitute, become realized. A few months ago, I gave a talk to a congressional staff, a group of congressional staffers, a lot of the new congressmen that are, that are coming in. And I told them about an Asian country uh, that had suffered through decades of war, decades of occupation, had a dysfunctional political system, had no army, no resources, no infrastructure, uh, and, and was truly devastated. That country was South Korea in the 1950s. And if we look at it now, 70 years later, where is South Korea today? It's the 12th largest economy in the world. And I would maintain there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, I guess, inconsistencies maybe in that analogy, but I think what's consistent is many decades of American engagement. It's a fantastic example of what a country that was devastated and unstable can become with sustained levels of American involvement. A lot of people don't realize, and, and I bet many here don't, South Korea had a higher illiteracy rate in the 1950s than Afghanistan does today. So the folks saying that there are just too many things that need to be changed, uh, I think are just flat wrong. Uh, it can be done, it has been done, and with American engagement, we can do it. So what we're missing, I think, is just sending the right signal to the region. You know, every word coming from groups like this, coming from this administration, coming from folks involved should be consistent and that we are with you, Afghanistan, for the long haul. And we need to send a, a, the message to our Pakistani friends, to folks that are working against Afghanistan and others that don't hedge against us and work with us because we're not leaving. Um, but what we have to do here at home is we have to wrap Americans' minds around the fact that we're going to have to and need to and should, and it's in our national interest to support Afghanistan for a long time. Just as we supported Germany, just as we supported Japan, just as we supported South Korea. And many people think it's too expensive that's the, that's the response I often get as I'm giving talks like this. But I argue, I counter that it'll compel in comparison to trying to regain the trust and the cost of trying to regain the trust of the Afghan people after we've abandoned them, what they would view for a third time. So 
bear with me just one more moment because I've been talking a lot about Afghanistan, but that Afghanistan fits in a much broader picture and a much broader effort. In the book, I talk about my time embedded with soldiers and special forces with, from the United Arab Emirates. And it was just me and one other American with about 60 Emirati soldiers partnered with about 80 Afghan soldiers in Helmand and Aruzgan uh, in 2006. And what a powerful experience that was. We would go into these very, very remote villages. I would blend into the background as much as I could. And we would have an Arab officer standing next to an Afghan officer saying, look at Jakarta, look at Istanbul, look at Dubai, look at Abu Dhabi, look, what, look where these countries were, and then look where, what they've become now. Afghanistan can do the same thing, and the Taliban is not the way. Extremism is not the way to create a better future for your children. To have an Arab officer saying that was powerful, powerful stuff. Uh, but then he would take it a step further and say, look what the U.S. has done for the world since World War II. Germany, Japan, South Korea, Colombia, the Philippines. Again, powerful stuff. So in my view, our strategy has to be to undermine the legitimacy of extremism. They would then go further and start undermining a lot of these uneducated mullahs that were preaching kind of this, this garbage, frankly, out in, out in the Afghan uh, countryside. There's other important pieces to that. Uh, I'm convinced that education really is the kind of nuclear weapon against extremism. Um, you know, I was thrilled yesterday, I hope you all caught it, uh, to see uh, Malala Yousafzai's speech in, uh, in, in receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. The Nobel Committee gets it wrong a lot, but I think this time they got it right. And those are the types of leaders and future leaders that we need to be holding up in this generational effort. Our current coalition uh, in fighting ISIS, I think is right. I'm, I'm thrilled and we're right on to have a moderate Arab coalition fighting this level of extremism. But this is going to be a multi, multi-decade, if not hundred year long effort. A lot of people talk about Afghanistan as America's longest war. I think we're about 13 years into the rest of this century. And just as it took 70 years to defeat communism, the idea of communism is going to take that long to defeat the idea of extremism. And so how does this turn out? And people ask me, what, well, what does victory look like? You know, what does success look like? I would argue that it's when the bad guys, when the extremists can't recruit anymore. No one's attracted to their cause. And if you think about it, remember the Red Brigades in the 1980s, the Shining Path down in Peru? I mean, those organizations aren't even, they're given no credibility today. They couldn't recruit anyone if they tried. I think if we stay, people like you all in this room, people in the private sector, if you stay engaged, um, that one day, and America stays engaged, one day, these groups, ISIS, the Taliban, the Haqqanis, uh, Al-Qaeda, will suffer, will suffer the same fate as those communist groups. So, uh, you know, it's through free trade, it's through entrepreneurship, it's through education, it's through the basic freedoms uh, and, and a level of security that America can help Afghanistan uh, provide where we're going to find ourselves in a, you know, in a victorious place, but not for a long time. So I encourage each one of you to go out into your communities, speak out, talk to your neighbors, to your friends, talk to your congressmen, talk to their staff, tell them that America must remain engaged, that this current policy is wrong, and that we cannot turn our backs on the region. And for those that say it's too hard and too expensive, I say it's too expensive not to. And with that, I will stop, sir. Wow, Mike, um, you, could, you could not hear a pin drop in this room while you were talking. And we are we're kind of used to, given the acoustics in the back there, we're kind of used to, there's always some kind of background conversation going on, right? Well, not, not this morning, no. 
Uh, that was that was a powerful speech, and we are so uh, uh, grateful. We're, we're grateful to your service, Thank for you. your service, Mike. Um, Mike is a true American hero. I mean, think about it. You know, how many people have done what he has done and put it together to to play a role of now influencing the American people towards greater uh, sanity and uh, rationality on the part of uh, their thinking about Afghanistan. So thank you very much, and thank you again for being our keynote speaker for our 10th anniversary U.S.-Afghanistan Business thank Matchmaking you. Conference. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank I you. appreciate it. So uh, I think we can bring our uh, we take a deep breath after that. Uh, the, book is, the book is for sale uh, in the trade fair, by the way, and I, I encourage those of you who are reading fluently in English or even partially uh, to check it out. Um, it's powerful stuff. Okay, I think we can bring our construction and infrastructure panel uh, to the dais at this point. Uh, those of you, I think I saw Aziz Azimi, our moderator. Aziz, I know you have, Aziz has an important message for us, Technologist uh, Inc. founder and uh, CEO. Uh, he has an important message, but I gotta tell you, Aziz, that's a tough act to follow. Oh my God. All right. Um,